Good afternoon, my friends. I am Corey Shockey, the Director of Defense Strategy. Oh, I'm in my old job. I'm Corey Shockey, the head of the Foreign and Defense Policy team here at the American Enterprise Institute. And it's my great honor today to welcome Australia's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Women's Affairs here to the American Enterprise Institute. Maurice Payne is a senator from New South Wales. She was the first female defense minister in Australia's history. She is now the foreign minister, the minister for women's affairs. And um, if you will indulge me, somebody whose career has so exemplified the American Enterprise Institute's values of defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and making the world a freer and safer place. Won't you join me in welcoming Minister Payne? Thank you very much, Corey, for your extremely warm welcome. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be here at the American Enterprise Institute. I know it's an organization with a very strong focus on both academic and uh, policy independence. Uh, it's a pleasure to see a real live audience. That's a bonus if you're from Sydney right now. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to say how much I appreciate the work of the Institute uh, in particular. Uh, including and in bring, bringing together today's event. And we know that the Institute has a very proud record of achievement. And your research today, focusing on the critical issues in the Indo-Pacific, uh, for example, ensuring that we are maintaining our sovereignty, that we're benefiting from technological development, growing our economies and safeguarding our people in the face of sometimes significant challenges, that research makes a very valuable contribution. And it's a great pleasure to see you again uh, as well. I am very pleased to uh, be here in Washington, D.C. on what is uh, the 70th anniversary of the formal Australia-U.S. alliance. The ANZUS Treaty signed 70 years ago this month. The alliance was formed in the wake of World War II and the enormous destruction, the loss of life, was still painfully fresh. Although our troops first fought side by side in 1918 on the battlefields of France, of which I was compellingly reminded at Arlington this morning, ours was still a new partnership in 1951, when the ANZUS Treaty was signed in San Francisco by Secretary of State Dean Acheson and Australia's Ambassador to the United States, Percy Spender. It was a partnership for Asia, a partnership to preserve peace and security, through which we pledged to act to meet the common danger. Now our region is identified as the Indo-Pacific, but the mission, even 70 years on, remains at its core the same. To work together in line with our values, to keep our people safe, and to preserve and enhance the peace and the stability of our neighbourhood. We remain as committed as ever to that goal as we face new and more complex challenges. Over the past 70 years, the commitment made by the United States to the Indo-Pacific has facilitated a period of unparalleled peace and strategic stability. It has underwritten decades of economic growth and stability. During my time as the Minister for Defence, now as Minister for Foreign Affairs, I've often joined with counterparts to affirm the Indo-Pacific focus of our alliance. The 31st Australia-United States Ministerial Consultations this week, my sixth, uh, and the trilateral security announcement made by our countries along with the UK have showed once again that as the strategic environment and the challenges evolve, we must and will adapt. In the 20th century, the geographic frame that drove much of global affairs was the Atlantic and Europe. The two world wars that were sparked in Europe went on to rewrite the global network of power. And today, the Indo-Pacific is the epicentre of both global opportunity and strategic competition. We see escalating tensions over maritime and territorial claims, particularly in the South China Sea the increasing use of coercion, including economic pressure, arbitrary detention, the use of malicious cyber activities, disinformation, foreign interference, technology 
as a central arena for competition and, of course, the continued and devastating scourge of terrorism. Overlaying, and in some cases compounding these tools of competition and security threats, is the global pandemic that has taken its toll on the vulnerable populations of the region and indeed weakened institutions. This is a contest in which Australia knows we cannot be a bystander. We are involved. We must be involved. My message here today is that Australia means to actively and purposefully contribute to shaping our region during this period of challenge. We'll do this in cooperation with partners, including through our alliance with the United States. We regard it as vital that we compete to preserve and shape the international order that has underpinned decades of stability and prosperity. Australia and the United States have a shared vision for the Indo-Pacific. We share a commitment to a region defined by openness, a place where freedom of navigation in accordance with, with international law is a given, where there's a thriving marketplace for the free flow of goods, of people and ideas. Our two nations share a commitment to an Indo-Pacific that is inclusive, a region where we respect and engage in the regional architecture built by the people who live here and a region in which the many voices, perspectives and players are respected. ASEAN is central. A grouping that represents the will of sovereign countries to work together to ensure their region is not dominated by any one nation. The dynamics of our region are changing rapidly as a constellation of nations charts new pathways. Most obviously, China, with its rapid economic growth and increasing assertiveness. This is putting pressure on the system of international laws, rules and norms that have been carefully built over generations to keep states from transgressing upon the interests of others. And if we are to preserve a region in which the rights and sovereignty of all nations are respected, irrespective of their size or power, then it's up to each of us to contribute to ensuring that, while those rules and norms necessarily evolve with the times, they maintain the core principles that have long worked in the interests of all. Of course, states in our region have individual strengths to contribute. Before coming to Washington, I visited Jakarta, New Delhi and Seoul. Each recognises that the Indo-Pacific is key terrain in strategic competition and many of the issues that I've discussed with our counterparts here in Washington are also the subject of discussions in those other capitals. Countries in our region have agency and independence to chart their own course. They have their own perspectives. Australia, the United States and other partners do and will need to work hard to make sure our vision for an open, secure, inclusive, resilient, prosperous Indo-Pacific is shared and embraced and not misunderstood. The way that vision is put into practice does, will vary from state to state. We are each different sovereign nations. We're inclusive in how we work with others to achieve this outcome. Like the United States, Australia is a very proud democracy. We believe it serves the needs of its people as no other political system. But we don't seek to impose this system on others. Importantly, our values are consistent with the interests of our partners. Our two countries have demonstrated that democracy delivers. The United States has been the world's largest economy for more than a century, while Australia enjoyed continuous economic growth for an unheard of 29 years before the pandemic struck. These successes at home form the basis for solid and effective foreign policy. Australia knows that our ability to shape our region depends on having a strength and a resilience to be a credible voice and to have influence with others. Our alliance is up to the task of turning our values and our principles into practical action that strengthens our region. And to safeguard our security and our prosperity, 
We undertake joint military exercises. We draw on the strength of our highly interoperable defence forces, uh, including in Exercise Talisman Sabre, the latest of which concluded last month. US Marines rotate through Darwin on a regular basis. We've long had Australian military personnel posted in the United States. Since the Korean War, we have often been the first ally to contribute forces alongside the United States. Our contribution and our sacrifice continues today and most recently in Afghanistan. Today, ANZUS itself, of 70, at 70 years of age, is much more than just a military alliance. It also reflects our strong and vital economic links, particularly trade and investment, with businesses and companies on both sides of the Pacific reaching across to invest in each other's future. 2020 marked 15 years since the United States Free Trade Agreement entered into force, bringing both certainty and stability along with its liberalising effects. The Australia-US Free Trade Agreement has helped two-way trade double and two-way investment triple since it entered into force. Now, the AUKUS partnership, which will bring together our technology, our scientists, our industry and our defence forces will build significantly on our existing cooperation with the United States in key areas, including guided missile technology, hypersonic aviation, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. There's enormous potential in the future areas of collaboration. Artificial intelligence, cyber quantum technology and undersea capabilities. Maintaining our technological edge will be critical, indeed crucial, to influencing the shape of the Indo-Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, we're also working together to support recovery from COVID-19. The United States has donated more vaccines overseas than any other country. For our part, Australia has shown our commitment to health security through our regional response to the pandemic. When COVID-19 emerged last year, we pivoted our development program to support our neighbours in preventing and preparing for and responding to outbreaks. In fact, we redirected nearly a quarter of our development support to address critical needs, importantly, based on the priorities of our partner countries. We deployed over 100 tonnes of humanitarian supplies on Australian-supported flights. We have sent 11 Australian medical teams to six countries across the region to help establish test facilities and train frontline health workers. We have a team currently in Timor-Leste. We're contributing $750 million for vaccine support and we will share at least 20 million vaccine doses with the Indo-Pacific by mid-2022. We are a supporter of and a participant in COVAX, contributing $130 million to date. We have already donated and delivered more than 3.1 million doses to countries in the Pacific and Southeast Asia, with many more deliveries planned for the coming weeks and months. And wherever possible, we are cooperating with others, as we have made clear between our two countries through the OSMIN Global Health Security Statement, and as we are doing on infrastructure, on development assistance, including for women and girls, and on delivering for the region. All of these things are a significant part of the subject matter uh, for my meeting with Samantha Power this morning, the Director of USAID. There's also no better example of this than the Quad Vaccine Partnership, which is expanding access to safe and effective COVID vaccines in the Indo-Pacific by procuring doses and supporting delivery. Australia's role in the Quad Vaccine Partnership is about supporting last mile delivery in Southeast Asia. It complements the investments by the United States and Japan and India. The Quad itself, it embodies our belief in the strength of our liberal democratic system to deliver security and prosperity for our people and for our partners. Boosted by its elevation to a leader's level, with the first in-person leaders meeting coming just next week. The Quad has a positive and a practical agenda to support regional partners to respond to the defining challenges of our time. I think what the COVID crisis has demonstrated more clearly than ever 
is that in a highly interconnected global world, we have no choice but to cooperate on global standards for the environment, for health, for trade and technology. And the only way we can do that is through a global rules-based order supported by strong leadership, such as the leadership provided by the United States over many decades. The United States remains at the heart of the global economy. Strengthening the US economy isn't just good for Americans, it's good for the region. Trade, investment, cooperation between governments will help Indo-Pacific countries recover from the pandemic and help them find new pathways to growth and to build resilience in the face of coercion. And in 2021, we also need to position ourselves to set the rules of the future of trade important digital standards that will allow our digitally connected economies to thrive. Because if we don't, others will. We must act to protect our region from creeping authoritarianism, digital or otherwise. Australia will also continue to push for strengthened economic rulemaking, including reform of international trade rules and greater resilience in the supply chains that keep the global economy running, will work with the United States as well as other partners to achieve this. From emissions reduction through technology, to adaption and, uh, adaptation and resilience, to oceans and biodiversity, Australia is a partner for the United States in driving resilience and a low emissions future for the Indo-Pacific. Our nation is on the front line of climate change with whole sectors, including our farmers, working hard to adapt and to reduce emissions. Australia is on the pathway to net zero with the goal of getting there as soon as we possibly can and particularly using te technological innovation. And we're also committed to using technology to support the region's green energy transition. Already, we're working with US business, including on emerging climate technologies. We're engaged, for example, through Vizzy's uh, US $400 million paper recycling plant in Kentucky. Australian company Tritium manufacturing EV charging, uh, EV charging stations in the United States. Fortescue's green hydrogen plans. Hyzon Motors growing hydrogen truck, truck fleet in Australia and the United States. We particularly welcome our growing collaboration, including through the Quad, to advance an effective and integrated response to the challenge of climate change in the Indo-Pacific. I also wanted to note, uh, if I may, some of the issues that Australia has faced recently, and particularly with China. We've clearly acknowledged the recent challenges uh, we have uh, experienced. China has placed conditions on dialogue instead of perhaps negotiating a way forward. And Australia, on the other hand, is always open to dialogue. At yesterday's Osmin meeting, we discussed the strategic competition of China at a number of levels that requires us to respond uh, and to increase resilience. This does not mean that there are not constructive areas for engagement with China. There are. We stand firm by our decisions and continue to uphold our sovereign rights while remaining open to a way forward based on mutual respect, which means uh, China acknowledging and accepting that the rights of other states to advance and protect their interests are equally valid. We have warmly welcomed the support Australia has received from the Biden administration in these current challenges. One significant advantage that the United States and Australia have in the world is our rich array of friendships. We very much appreciate the administration's unequivocal statements on the importance of allies and partners. A wide range of states across the world also support a rules-based order, one that protects the rights of states, no matter their size, their weight, their political persuasion or their willingness to express their views. Others in the region who may also be subject to coercion need to hear loudly and clearly that they are not alone. We know the majority of nations in the Indo-Pacific see value in the principles, the standards and the norms of behaviour that have delivered the decades of growth and stability to our region and that continue to serve our common interest. What we seek 
is a region in which the conduct of all nations adheres to internationally accepted rules and norms. A region in which might does not make right. For our part, Australia will consistently respond to malicious behaviour and defend our interests. China, of course, has significant influence and a right to be heard. But it also has a responsibility to observe the rules and norms that exist to serve the interests of all countries. Healthy competition within a set of rules, stability between countries, the promotion of trade and economic activity that raises standards of living and enhances human welfare, these are actually the bases of the lives which people want to live. These are the principles on which the alliance between our nations has long delivered uh, and which remain at its heart. Australia will continue in the decades ahead, next 70 years perhaps, to work with the United States and other partners to build that regional resilience, to uphold the rules that bring peace and prosperity to all. Australia and the United States will, as we always have, speak up in defence of individual freedoms and dignity and the rights of states under international law. We will differ at times, but we will find enduring strength and the strongest bonds in the principles and values that we share. I want to conclude by citing Hal Brands, one of the Institute's senior fellows. He has written, and I quote, competition and confrontation are not synonymous. Embarking upon long-term competition does entail a willingness to run certain risks and accept higher tensions in key relationships. Competition, however, does not inevitably imply a spiral into outright conflict. It does not necessitate abandoning diplomacy and it can actually reduce the chances of war." Unquote. As Australia's Foreign Minister, I wholeheartedly embrace Hal's proposition that diplomacy always has a role, even in times of competition and tension. The evolving strategic shape of the Indo-Pacific is perhaps the major question of the 21st century. The task of influencing that evolution cannot be left to any one nation. And we encourage participation from all. The shared values and indeed the sacrifices that have sustained our alliance for seven decades as we have worked side by side epitomises this participation. By building upon it, extending our hands to new partners and enriching cooperation with old friends, we can build a more secure and more prosperous future for all. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Let me say both for our audience present in the room and for people live streaming the um, event that you can send your questions to Sarah Nakasone. Uh, you can also send them by, by email to Sarah Nakasone. Uh, you can also send them by Twitter, hashtag <coughs> Maurice Payne at AEI. Excellent. And um, Minister, you should feel free to sure. sit down if you like. Uh, we have a series of questions, but the first thing I'd like to say uh, is to express admiration for the courageous stand that Australia has taken as a frontline state. It's an enormously important example for free people everywhere um, and feels especially nice on this day of celebration of the ANZUS Treaty to recognize what fabulous role models Australians have been for all of us. I very much liked in your comments that you mentioned that, um, that the importance of the friendships that the United States and Australia has with others in the region as a major strategic advantage for us. It seemed to me a mistake for my country to describe uh, the challenges of managing a rising China as great power competition, because that suggests it's us versus China. And I love the way you framed it as 
free countries everywhere and countries who are invested in a rules-based order that allows small and middle-sized countries enormous weight in the shaping of the order. That's what China mm -hmm. is trying to overturn. And I thought that came through so powerfully in your comments. Since you have been both defense minister and foreign minister, I'd love to ask you to expound a little bit more on the defense aspects of the Australia-UK-US agreement that you brought into force here in this trip to Washington. Uh, the AUKUS, uh, as it's known, um, perhaps not the smoothest of uh, acronyms, but uh, what can you do with those letters uh, <laughs> otherwise? Um, uh, the AUKUS, uh, I think, is a, a reasonably natural progression. I know it's a very significant progression, but I think it has uh, a natural underpinning given the uh, history uh, and the depth of the relationships between the three countries involved. Uh, for Australia, uh, our relationships, partnerships, alliances with the United Kingdom and with the United States are both uh, of the longest standing and uh, the greatest depth and, uh, and breadth. Uh, we have habits of cooperation which have formed uh, over those many years. And uh, I think what it will bring is a, um, a degree of cooperation amongst the three countries which is absolutely fit for purpose in the 21st century. So we are in a period of extraordinarily dynamic change, of rapid military development, uh, of, uh, of changes in science and technology that uh, we can barely keep up with. Uh, well, certainly the younger people in the room are going to be doing a better job of it than I am. Uh, and so I think uh, what this sets us up for into uh, the future uh, is the, the chance to formally take advantage of all of those together and to share the opportunities that are going to be part of that. Uh, the research, the scientific development, the technological development uh, in a whole range of areas, but uh, particularly, as you say, in the, in the defence fields. Michael Brown, the head of the defense um, experimental unit that DOD has out in Silicon Valley, is fond of saying that uh, we're so worried about the magnitude of China's big data. And yet, if the United States and its allies could find technology sharing arrangements, we would have a database mm. much larger and more diverse and more vibrant than what China has. And it looks to me like one of the really important aspects of the arrangements that you all have agreed to in the last couple of days is the technology sharing, not just transfer from the US to mm. Australia, but from Australia to the US and Britain and back again. That seems to me a, a really important piece of it that we're a little bit overshadowing with the discussion of nuclear submarines. Perhaps understandably, but, uh, but this is uh, much more than tech transfer. Uh, and, uh, and I think its uh, potential to build in the, uh, in the coming years and decades um, is, as I said in my, in my previous remarks, uh, significant. We have so many shared interests uh, across uh, our three nations. We have so much uh, to gain from increasing uh, that sharing, from increasing even our interoperability. I think uh, in terms of managing the uh, strategic challenges of the future, uh, that uh, I think it's one of the most exciting decisions I've seen in my uh, public life. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was in the Bush White House and had to do coalition management for countries that had troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, one of the things I noticed that was unique about the government of Australia is that lots of Americans' friends want to explain to us what we are doing badly, and we are very often doing a lot badly. <laughs> but what is so interesting and I think unique about Australian foreign policy is that when seeing deficiencies in American policy, you move as you have with this agreement, which was engendered in Australia, as I understand it, you move to provide policy alternatives or policy experiments that can advance it. Can you give us a sense of where this one came from? <laughs> Uh, I, I think this is the, the outcome, particularly led by our Prime Minister, of uh, his consideration of the strategic circumstances uh, which uh, are ahead of us uh, and uh, the extraordinary pace of change uh, that we see uh, in the Indo-Pacific but also globally. 
and uh, his determination to, to make sure that Australia was positioning itself to absolutely protect our national interests, to protect our sovereignty, uh, but importantly, where it's possible to do that with uh, the most fundamentally important of our partners, um, then I think there's a compelling logic attached to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to me how many different um, turns of the kaleidoscope Australia has in partnerships throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, the Japanese Australian Secured Supply Chains Initiative, the uh, Pacific Islanders Initiative. Um, you're the orchestrator of <laughs> all of these different relationships. How do you see them fitting together? Where does the Five Eyes cooperation fit with the US, uh, Australia, and UK partnership that just came? How does this fit with the Quad? How do you see these working um, in conjunction with each other? I think what the 21st century shows us is that we need to be flexible, we need to be uh, dynamic and responsive, and not all of the existing structures are, uh, are ideal for every circumstance uh, with which we are we are dealing. I'm not sure whether um, the metaphor of Australia being the conductor of the uh, of that orchestra uh, is is one we want to extend too far. Apart from anything else, I'm tone deaf, uh, so we don't <laughs> want to take it too far musically. Um, but the I, th I think the I think the it, the different entities. Uh, fit in their own spaces uh, and places. Uh, but we've seen, particularly even in the last uh, 18 months to two years as a result of, um, of uh, circumstances driven by COVID, we've seen new groupings and different groupings arise. We have seen the development of the, of the quad, interestingly, uh, in a way that perhaps was not foreseen five years ago. So three years ago, uh, 2018, I think I sat down uh, at the first, or maybe it was 2019, at the first um, in-person meeting of quad foreign ministers. Uh, in New York and the sidelines of, uh, of the UNGA Leaders Week uh, with then Secretary Pompeo, uh, with uh, uh, Toshi Motegi, the Japanese Foreign Minister, and, uh, and Secret um, Minister Jay Shankar uh, from India. Uh, that first meeting has been the impetus for a lot of the progression that has uh, occurred since. And if you think about what's going to happen next week, uh, where the President of the United States and the Prime Ministers of uh, of Australia, India and Japan will meet in person to discuss some of the more challenging issues of, uh, of 2021 and of the current uh, environment, including uh, collaboration on COVID-19, uh, including issues around critical technologies, uh, climate and technology, uh, disinformation, these sorts of, uh, of matters that they have been working on and we have been working on uh, since that first foreign ministers meeting and, and before. Uh, it's about being responsive uh, to what is uh, is necessary in the international strategic environment. Um, I'm proud of the role that Australia plays uh, across a number of um, of uh, pages, if you like, of uh, that musical score. Uh, whether it is in the Pacific, whether it is our focus on ASEAN centrality in the Indo-Pacific. We're not a member of ASEAN, of course, uh, but our Indo-Pacific outlook, the view that we have of the Indo-Pacific, has ASEAN absolutely at its core. I had an extraordinarily valuable opportunity in Jakarta last week uh, to meet with all of the permanent representatives from the ASEAN members uh, to ASEAN there, all of the, uh, the ambassadors. Um, that is, uh, I, I do have the opportunity to meet from time to time with my counterpart foreign ministers, of course, whether it's uh, the ASEAN Australia meetings or the East Asia Summit or as part of the ASEAN Regional Forum, but to actually sit in person in a room in Jakarta with all of those ambassadors, highly skilled diplomats in their own right, uh, to hear their perspectives and views, their priorities, articulate them on behalf of, uh, of their nations and the things that they wanted to communicate to Australia, uh, again, a really Im important opportunity. So taking all of those um, individual components and putting them into one strategic whole, uh, I think is, uh, is um, emblematic of the multi-layered approach uh, in which Australia works uh, and uh, which enables us uh, to be very focused on those um, values and principles that, uh, that I spoke about. 
The, the selection of COVID-19 vaccinations as a major quad initiative early on seems to me a terrific example of being responsive to the region's needs. And, and the Chinese are attempting to make the quad sound uh, ominous to other countries in Asia. And so the vaccine initiative seems to me such a useful one to showcase the difference between what uh, the Quad countries and other countries in Asia want for problem solving and advancing mm. their interests. There is one country that is um, not happy with the recent initiative, and that would be France. The, your French counterpart uh, described it as a stab in the back to France. How should the United States, Australia, and the UK respond to this? How do we remind France that they are a valuable ally and great contributor to global security? Well, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that is, that is absolutely correct and, uh, and no question uh, in my mind. Uh, I have uh, very important relationships um, across uh, uh, by, with my counterpart, uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian. We were uh, both defence ministers together, now foreign ministers together, a number of friends uh, through the French system, as does uh, Australia, of course. But I absolutely understand their disappointment. Um, there's no doubt uh, that these are, uh, are very difficult issues uh, to, uh, to manage, uh, but we will continue to uh, approach constructively uh, and, uh, and uh, closely with our, uh, with our colleagues in France uh, on these matters. The, uh, the Prime Minister and President Macron have had the opportunity to, um, to work together on a range of issues um, in, in recent times. Uh, but um, when commercial decisions, uh, strategic decisions, frankly, are of this nature are made, of course it's difficult. And uh, I don't shy away from that. Uh, my task is to, uh, to work as hard as I can uh, with my counterpart and with uh, senior French officials to make sure that they do understand the value we place on the role that they play, uh, do understand the value that we place on the bilateral relationship uh, and the work that we want to continue to do together. Their role in the Pacific in particular, if I could comment on that uh, briefly, we're uh, part of a um, uh, humanitarian, folk, humanitarian disaster relief focused group uh, known as France, 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 Australia and, and New Zealand. Uh, often we are the, uh, the group that goes to respond to natural disasters uh, in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, we work closely with the French territories in the Pacific, with New Caledonia, with French Polynesia. They are members of the Pacific Island Forum, another one of those entities that is part of that, um, that fabric. Uh, and, uh, and I know how important uh, the region is to, uh, to France and uh, it will continue to be so. We have a question from my AEI colleague, Sadnan Dume. Australia is one of only two countries that is part of both the Quad and AUKUS. How do you see these two groupings complementing each other? Are there things you expect the Australia, UK, US to be able to achieve that the Quad could not? I think they're completely different, actually. Uh, completely different. I think uh, the um, description, uh, Corey, that you've given of, uh, of what AUKUS will do uh, and in terms of its focus on, uh, on defence science and technology, uh, on uh, that tripartite uh, engagement between our countries, uh, it is um, qualitatively different from um, the diplomatic network that is, uh, that is the Quad and for the very reasons that you've identified as you talked about the importance of things like a vaccine initiative uh, which delivers on the priorities of the region uh, which delivers on the needs of the region as identified by them. Uh, we've been really careful uh, and, uh, and very clear in our engagement, for example, on vaccines. Australia has, uh, with all of our Pacific partners for whom we are providing either health security or economic security support in the context of COVID, an individual separate bilateral partnership designed by the country and Australia together. Each one is different. The needs of Tuvalu are completely different from the needs of Fiji. The needs of Nauru are completely different from the needs of Samoa uh, and so on. The same goes for each of our individual vaccine programs uh, with each country. So 
where we've endeavoured, for example, to provide end-to-end -end support, um, supply, del delivery supply, uh, and assistance with, uh, with distribution and administration. Um, that uh, would be different in, in one country than, uh, than from another. So I think making sure that you're focusing on those, uh, those priorities, the vaccine plans of the nations themselves, uh, as, uh, as uh, I might, might have said uh, in the context of, of yesterday's Osmin, um, our approach is to ask, how can we help you? What do you need? Um, and not really to, to premise that question based on what strategic advantage it might give us, give another country. I have a question from my AEI colleague, Zach Cooper, which is the response from Beijing was probably expected, but was the Australian government surprised by the quick and negative feedback from New Zealand and how are other regional countries responding? I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with that uh, characterization. I think, uh, uh, my Prime Minister and Prime Minister Ardern uh, had a, have had a good conversation about uh, the uh, the AUKUS uh, development. I've certainly had a very productive conversation with my Foreign Minister colleague uh, Nanea Mahuta uh, just this uh, just this week, uh, and uh, we understand New Zealand's position um, on nuclear matters. It's been crystal clear uh, for uh, for a very long time. Okay. Uh, so uh, it is um, a, a response that uh, that we expected in that context. Uh, and, uh, and further, I know that there has also been a welcoming of the, uh, the US and the UK engagement in the Indo-Pacific in, uh, uh, in that response. Um, in relation to, uh, to the response of, uh, of China, um, I, would, uh, I would say uh, that uh, I don't agree with the propositions put by the, the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs uh, on this, uh, that uh, our focus is on contributing to the security and stability of the Indo-Pacific, uh, to do that constructively and openly and transparently, uh, and uh, continue to work closely with our partners in the region. And of course, as I've also observed this week, uh, if there are issues that China would wish to raise with us, then my Prime Minister is always available to speak to President Xi, and I am always available to speak to State Councillor Wang Yi. China's strategy um, appears to me to be self-defeating, namely the pressure that they attempted to put on Australia, the 14 objections, the, um, the efforts to suborn uh, members of parliament, the, uh, the refusal to accept import, all of those things look to have actually strengthened the Australian public's resistance to, to Chinese influence. Does it feel that way to you? What's the, uh, give us a sense for uh, what the conversation in Australia is like about China these days. Uh, well, um, I would turn your attention to the Lowy Institute poll. And uh, Lowy, of course, has a, uh, an esteemed reputation in, uh, uh, in uh, international security and uh, foreign affairs and uh, similar matters. Uh, they have uh, done, been doing annual polls of, at, of attitudes in Australia for a long time. Uh, and there has been a change in, in Australian attitudes. I think um, if you find yourself confronted in your own nation by efforts to compromise your national interests and your sovereignty, uh, then you're likely to respond viscerally. Uh, and many Australians uh, have... Uh, have, uh, ha have uh, do hold concerns about those sorts of, uh, of actions. There's a list, as you said, of 14 items that uh, Australia should rectify. Uh, they include things like freedom of the press. They include academic freedom in think tanks and universities. They include freedom of speech for members of parliament. Uh, they include uh, not making decisions uh, in relation to our telecommunications system that we believe were fundamentally in our national security and our national interests. Uh, in relation to 5G, they include uh, not suggesting that uh, the international community should pursue a rigorous independent investigation into the origins of uh, COVID-19, which, as we know, has now been responsible for uh, countless, uh, well, not countless, too many deaths, frankly, uh, and uh, uh, an economic impact that uh, will take the world, many countries in my region, our region, our shared region, a long time to recover from. So 
Uh, there is not a country, I think, that sits around a table such as the G7, a table uh, such as uh, any of the, um, of the uh, pieces of architecture that you've referred to today, which would ever compromise uh, on those points as democracies. Uh, as much as, uh, as, much as um, rigorous press freedom uh, is always a healthy check on uh, politicians' egos, uh, <laughs> as much as uh, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, rigorous research of uh, Australian academics uh, currently uh, occasionally has the same impact <laughs> on those same egos, um, I wouldn't swap them for the alternative in a million years. In addition to being foreign minister, you are also the minister for women's affairs. Um, and I'd be interested in asking you to reflect a little bit on what do you think the critical issues, where do those two portfolios overlap most for you? What are the issues of women and girls that are most pressing in a foreign policy context? Australia has had gender at the forefront of, uh, of our development and humanitarian programs and of our foreign policy for as long as, as I can remember uh, from my active involvement in, in these areas. But it has absolutely grown um, over, over the years. Uh, we have uh, appointed uh, for uh, a number of years now an ambassador for women and girls, which is, uh, which is uh, sort of um, translated into an ambassador for gender equality, uh, in very active in the region uh, in particular to... Uh, to support uh, our interests uh, in focusing on the position of women and girls in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so that's where I think the, um, the, uh, the two portfolios uh, very much come together. Uh, but the challenges of COVID-19 have, particularly in the region, uh, really had a significant impact on, uh, on women and girls. If you think about the collapse of regional economies in the Pacific, uh, largely because of restrictions on movement, complete absence of tourism and, uh, and hospitality, that, that the workers in those economies are overwhelmingly women mm -hmm. uh, and the impact on their families is, is significant. Uh, if you think about um, the health security challenges where they will find themselves in, uh, in uh, in economic situations, which were probably already uh, somewhat of a struggle, uh, now trying to deal with uh, children at home uh, with no job themselves uh, and with, uh, with a health security situation, which um, uh, does not reflect the um, privileged position that we all enjoy. Uh, very acutely conscious of the uh, recovery process and uh, the need to make sure that across the Pacific and in Southeast Asia, uh, we're addressing those issues. We've had to pivot a lot of our development programs, which have not been able to be delivered in COVID because of lockdowns and restrictions and um, restrictions on uh, even officials being able to travel uh, around countries uh, themselves. Uh, and so we've tried to make sure where we uh, have needed to pivot those that uh, we are still providing that support, but it's not easy. Uh, and I, I hope that as we move out of that uh, that phase with uh, the increasing uh, rates of vaccination, uh, that that will change. That brings me to increasing rates. That brings me to the issue of, of, of vaccination. We do have to make sure that uh, whilst our own nations are pushing very hard to reach particular levels, um, percentages, whether they're 70% or 80% of, of our eligible populations vaccinated, that we still have a very, very big task ahead of us in terms of the developing uh, world and many parts of our own region. Uh, that's why those initiatives, for example, in the Quad are so important. That's why the United States donations of vaccines overseas and Australia's ability to contribute in our region are so important. Uh, we've worked incredibly closely with, uh, with countries in the Pacific on their priorities uh, and it continues to be uh, an ongoing process. We've delivered um, in, in Fiji to respond to their uh, Delta surge in recent months, uh, over 850,000 vaccines. They have a very good delivery rate mm. uh, and they have had to, but um, it is work that we are doing closely together. Some of those um, medical teams that I referred to have spent time in Fiji uh, to ensure that 
a health system which has been under enormous strain but is staffed by incredible, loyal, dedicated professionals um, has had some support from countries like Australia and, and New Zealand. In Timor-Leste, we see now a Delta surge, which is of great concern to them. We're doing the same there and have delivered almost 600,000 vaccines uh, into uh, Timor-Leste. Um, they are spectacularly efficient at administering vaccines and where the developed world, as I understand it, and again, no music and no medical experience, but as I understand it, <laughs> the developed world largely gets four vaccinations out of a vial. In Timor-Leste, they are so efficient, they are overwhelmingly getting five out of a vial. So they're even able to deliver more uh, than, uh, than we were able to count or than we had counted on as we prepared those batches. So um, it's hands-on, uh -huh. it's, uh, it's practical, but uh, it's part of making sure that uh, we are partnering with, uh, with our communities. We've also um, developed a program called Pacific Women Lead. Uh, it's part of our, uh, our gender focus in the Pacific. There are a number of Pacific countries who have no elected women. Uh, so if you merely had an engagement that included women ministers or women in parliament, you wouldn't get participants from every country. We've expanded Pacific Women Lead uh, to include senior civil servants, for example, of, mm -hmm. and they are spectacularly talented, smart, driven uh, contributors to, uh, to public life in their countries. And COVID, ironically, has made it possible because it's <laughs> virtual. Uh, kind of over the WebEx Zoom life, but nevertheless, um, it has really enabled us to make connections which otherwise would have been very difficult to make. Mm. Um, you know, getting the permission of your government to travel to a Pacific Women Lead meeting, I, I think that might have been, uh, <laughs> might have had some hard moments in it. And I'm very proud to say that uh, the Pacific Island Forum, which is the key piece of regional architecture in the Pacific, now incorporates in its annual leaders meeting agenda a meeting of Pacific women. That had never happened before. It had never been part of the formal leaders' agenda. I think it's a great outcome. And um, my good friend, uh, Fiame uh, Naomi Mataafa, who has just become the first female prime minister of Samoa, uh, she will be one of the key participants in that meeting in the coming months. Fantastic. She is great. I love her. One more, on a more discouraging note, it seems to me that women and girls in Afghanistan are likely to bear quite a lot of the burden of recent policy choices by our governments to uh, rapidly end our military involvement in Afghanistan. Can you give a sense of where we should be looking to push our policies towards Afghanistan in the future now that these decisions have been made, now that these actions have been taken? What next for Afghan policy, and in particular towards uh, trying to shield women and girls in Afghanistan from the likely consequences of Taliban rule? I think that is a, uh, a very difficult uh, question to, to answer right now. Uh, I would have to say I think this is a, um, a work in progress uh, for several reasons. It, without telling tales or, or speaking uh, out of turn, uh, it was the subject of much of my meeting with Samantha Power today. How will we continue to, to deliver both humanitarian and development assistance uh, into Afghanistan and particularly to, uh, to women and girls? Uh, and how will we ensure the safety of those who are delivering it, yeah. given we are not uh, present ourselves? Uh, how will we uh, ensure the, um, um, the equity, equality of distribution um, uh, across the country? Because I think there will be variable um, administrations, province by province. Uh, and what undertakings do we need from uh, the regime, the Taliban regime, uh, to enable that? So there is a lot of work being done uh, on this now. I know that um, Martin Griffiths, through his role with the UN, is key on that humanitarian assistance side. There was a uh, ministerial meeting convened by the Secretary General the UN uh, earlier this week in which I participated from uh, from Korea uh, where which was ultimately a pledging conference but uh, was important for bringing some of those I those those commitments together um, forcing countries to think about what was possible in that way Australia for one does does not want to be 
distributing any funding through the Taliban regime. We want to work with uh, UN and other international organisation partners. Uh, what mechanisms will there be for that? And then in the development sense, so longer term than the immediate humanitarian crisis, what does that look like uh, going forward? Um, we have in the past, for example, as the United States has, uh, funded Afghan-led, Afghan-run um, non-government organisations, particularly organisations to support women and girls. Um, do they have a future? It's unlikely. Uh, what replaces those, uh, that remains to be seen. So I can't answer your question uh, in terms of the how uh, yet, but uh, I would like to assure anyone who is um, in the room and anyone who is listening that this is a matter of focus for uh, the international community and uh, the priority is, uh, is not lost on us. If I could ask a question about cyber and in particular election security and cyber. Both Australia and the US have elections coming up next year. Um, it seems an area of obvious focus given our intelligence cooperation, the depth of that, but also the technological cooperation that the new agreement between the US, Australia, and the UK come forward. How are you thinking about that issue? Are there, where does it fit in the priorities for these three countries' cooperation? I think quite high. I mean, cyber certainly fits very high in the uh, in the three countries' uh, priorities. I released our uh, cyber critical technologies international strategy earlier this year, uh, with um, under the leadership of our ambassador for cyber and critical technologies, who might be known to some of your uh, your audience, uh, Dr. Tobias Feakin. Uh, that's important work for Australia, and uh, we have had a chance to work closely in the two. Uh, working groups in the UN to achieve uh, outcomes which, res which are essentially focused on ensuring that uh, um, the rules uh, on the road apply in the, uh, in the, in the cyberspace uh, as well, uh, and that uh, we are very focused on protecting ourselves in terms of, uh, of cybersecurity. Uh, I think in the electoral sense, uh, we have become much more attuned to the threat that, uh, that uh, cyber breaches uh, pose uh, for us all, whether it's our political parties, uh, our electoral commissions, um, and uh, of course, at the, at the basis level, the distasteful uh, ideas of electoral fundraising, which are inevitable in uh, the democratic <laughs> process. Uh, all of those are, uh, are vulnerable, uh, I think, and uh, in uh, the last uh, 10 years, and I've been in Parliament uh, for a long time, but in the last 10 years I've seen exponential increase in the level of attention uh, paid to those issues. We're very conscious of, uh, of that, and we share a lot uh, in terms of where the threats are likely to come from, what the responses need to be, and how we protect ourselves. If I could ask one last question, uh, which is what are the issues that you are interested in that you think Americans aren't yet paying enough attention to? Where, where are uh, place, opportunities for policy cooperation or uh, for American civil society, since civil society is such an important part in both Australia and the US of our actual foreign policies? Where would you... Uh, like to see attention and activism that you don't yet see it from Americans? I think that's an interesting question, um, not one I've particularly turned my mind to, and I suspect that's because having been at the Osmin talks this week, that two plus two, um, they really are an extraordinary way to focus on a whole range of issues, a full gamut of issues uh, on which we share um, not necessarily the same interests, but share common interests. And so I feel like we're quite well, well done at the moment, actually, whether it's uh, on health security or, or, or on cyber, all these science and tech issues uh, that we've dis been discussing, the, uh, the significant increase uh, in, uh, in defence uh, engagement, uh, the change I've seen over six Osmins, and I've done obviously several as Defence Minister, several as, as Foreign Minister, really is the seriously substantive nature 
of the partnership in the work that sits under the uh, the Osmin uh, umbrella. Uh, so perhaps today's not the best day or the best <laughs> week uh, to be asking me. So maybe I'll start taking notes. <laughs> I wish we could do that with the United States um, because uh, ultimately there will be uh, more to do. But we've discussed space this week, for example. We've discussed uh, the, the health security in issues, the vaccine um, uh, focus. Uh, met with Gail Smith yesterday as part of the Osmin meeting. Uh, obviously, the work that we're doing together regionally in terms of, of defence uh, is, is just increasing exponentially year on year. In fact, probably month on month. Uh, all of those uh, those focuses, the technology, the low emissions technology work that uh, that we are doing, uh, the um, president's ambitions for the major economies uh, forum that uh, was convened this week, uh, his ambitions on a whole range of other issues, the summits that are occurring all the time. Uh, I can barely keep up um, <laughs> with uh, with those. Uh, even the practical nature of the exchange um, today with uh, with Director Power. Uh, about um, at the most fundamental level how America and the United States can be part of supporting women and girls into the future in Afghanistan. Given what we have done over the past two decades uh, and what needs to be done into the future, those fundamentals um, I always find, uh, I, if I could say that I am pushing on an open door, uh, and mm. I would like to think it's the same in reverse, uh, and that um, to extend that metaphor, you basically don't even need to knock. You know, we're very good friends and, um, and that is the way that it works. Ah, that's a wonderful way to celebrate 100 years of fighting <laughs> shoulder to shoulder, Indeed. 70 years of the alliance um, and the recent agreements that deepen it so much. Thank you for being such a good friend to the United States and thank you for coming to AEI today. Minister Maurice Payne, what's your journey? It's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me.